good evening. Can you hear me? I don't have a microphone at the moment. Well, it seems like everyone seems to be working hard on some deadlines or something. We, we don't have a huge audience, which is a pity, because uh, tonight's uh, guest, uh, Wolfgang Reeder, is a really uh, I'm sure the, the lecture will be extremely interesting. And uh, uh, as we know, architects uh, often struggle, or uh, I this perpetual struggle with construction industry, because uh, uh, methods that are used in the majority of construction industry are still uh, centuries, if not millennia, old somehow. And, and, and there is this very uh, kind of huge resistance of the matter as one thing, but also of the practice of the construction industry. Uh, lots of established uh, rigid models. And, and we rarely see uh, a kind of uh, more progressive invention in this domain. So the leader company is uh, based in Austria is one of these rare examples where we can see really exciting developments uh, in structuring, in cladding, in, in kind of uh, uh, working with materials and, and fabrication. And, and while uh, at uh, many schools at the moment of uh, design architecture in the world, we see attempts at the progressive um, uh, research and, and this kind of prototyping. Um, at the same time, uh, they are still isolated within walls of academia and uh, there are no too many um, sort of uh, crossings and, and real collaboration uh, with the industry. Um, so tonight's lecture hopefully will inspire you to think a little bit beyond these walls of, of academic research and uh, uh, I'm really glad to introduce a Vulcan reader. So good evening everybody. So thanks Alicia for the, your nice introduction. Thank you for having me here tonight. So I need to switch off the light now, right here. OK, thanks. Yeah, as said, my name is Wolfgang Rieder. I'm the so-called chairman or founder of a company called Rieder. I like this picture because it's you know, referencing the things what we do. So we turn dead material, which are in kind of way temporary but, and, and forced by sheer forces into smaller gravels and we turn it then to, into green ones. So tonight, and, and I think everybody is aware what concrete is and I think it's a rather an old material and I think this has been run around quite a while so we have a, a different approach. We have also some very interesting technology which I explain you later. So basically I will talk today about uh, glass fiber reinforced concrete, as you see here on, on a special machinery. It's manufactured by really strong Austrians, as you see on this picture, which is really representing our parts of our workforce in Austria. The way we do our work is based on high-tech uh, installation tools like scaffolding still available in the 21st century and pinned down to aluminum subframe. So it's mainly application of, of things. So it's a rather green material. I will come back to this later on in, com in, in comparison to, to other materials like HPL, aluminum and fiber cement. So I've been touring the US also quite a lot and they always ask me, you know, what is fiber C or what is your material special? And I say it's, it's you know, it is a, a thin concrete which adds a new flavor to the existing language of, of building envelopes. I would say there is thin glass, the thin wood, thin metal, and now you have thin concrete. This is a nice piece of architecture in, in Austria, Rainer Köbel. You've probably seen that in DSN, recently featured with our material. So I think one of the, the nice things about Concrete is also its nature, so it's, I, we call it, it's not a dead material by its own, so it has some living, some, some, some cloudiness or whatsoever. This is a project in Austria. It can be really high performance. This is uh, the standard hotel and it's this small part in the middle, not the glass part. So it was always a dream of mine to build a high rise, which we did. This is an example in Croatia, which I chose carefully. <laughs> so I show you a couple of, of nice projects, which probably demonstrate quite well where we came from. So this was one of our 
uh, key project and will ever be. So this is the Soccer City Stadium in Johannesburg where we did the total envelope. I would say not possible in Europe because they would never grant a contract to a fellow like me. And so they, they were really brave and I learned a lot about Africans and how they, you know, do architecture and, and, and do the construction. It was a very good experience for me. And I think it was really a nice work down there. So this is the total envelope. We came up with a, and this is also referencing to the, to the title, the, the limitation. So we were up against cheap Chinese aluminum. Also that we are, say, four or five times the costs, we came up with a modular system with a faster way of, 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 of installing. And we came up also with the idea uh, to, to, to penalize it on site. And overall, this leads to, to lower cost, despite our higher cost from an imported material from Europe. And so we could really compete. And this is one thing for me that, you know, there's several ways to look at things. And especially if you integrate the, the, the whole shell and the outer shell into your thinking, it's feasible that you use different materials and come up with new solutions. Uh, we've done a couple of projects, and we currently do uh, two with Saha. So they, they are companions when I headed out for my crusade in the name, in the sake of good architecture, like I talked to some guys within Saha. This was one of my first. It's a bridge in Saragossa. It's well featured with 29,000 triangles all cut to size, uh, having a, a, a certain pattern. And we the first time run into heavy computering models on, based on Rhino. And uh, we had no way at that time to figure out uh, or to make it faster to, to, to get the patterns and, 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 and to, to do it better in our factory. So we had all these interface issues, which I think is, is a major issue among the whole build industry to overcome that. And there's, many uh, industries, and if you look across industries, there's many industries who do this much better than we do. So this is one of the existing ones. This is actually, I have an economics background. This is the, the Saha building, and this is actually as of yesterday. So we did some shots there. So we have curved panels. We have 3D panels, which are cut by our ro robots and or I wouldn't call it robots, but our milling machines, but they are all, so we are currently being able to, to really transfer the, the Rhino model directly onto our machines. And this is really gives us a competitive edge. It's also, I have to highlight, it puts some pressure on the architects as well, because you have to be really precise with your modeling. And this is an, uh, another issue which is highlighted if there is a, a direct link between the drawing and the output. So this is a really nice one. This is, was also a cool uh, booth at the Swiss Bau in, in, in Basel. And it's very easily achieved. So by remember when we manufacture our panel, it, it it's lays on, on, on a foil or it sits on a, on, on a, on a plate, basically. And what we did, we, we, we put something underneath in that kind. It was a rounded shape of a styrofoam. And by putting this underneath and, and the, the, the panel or the concrete matrix still not cured, it achieves a certain pattern, which forms on a total envelope a very interesting pattern in, in total randomness. Another good example for, for uh, forming our panels was this one. It's a building in Prague where you see these fins, and these fins are uh, were made out of one panel where we bend it and the, the edges up front, and they form then these fins, and they give shade to the total facade. And this is without uh, interfering with the people who stand inside and look outside. So this was a good example. There's a mother, so some vinish flooring, so our material can be really used on floor, roof, and, and wall everywhere. This was an object made with the University of Innsbruck, where this 
for the Maison des Objets in, in Paris. And by, by folding these panels, we, we really achieved more stiffness. So there's really two sides. There's one, this uh, design or, or shape kind of thing. And the other thing is by, by, by folding it, it really you know, increases by five to tenfold the stiffness of the, the whole thing. So we could really span 1.5 meters without any support and having really heavy loads onto that. There's some other nice architecture. Some, we have a product called Oco Skin where we put it into slat walls. So there's, yeah, there's also, sorry for, for the ref, using the word nice a lot. I know that this is not the proper term in architecture, but I call it nice. But, you know, being an entrepreneur and really want to push it, the limits, this is really for me not enough. You know, I really want to move things forward and I think that's why I'm also here uh, that I want to really hear from the other side and to really see what is relevant. So I've talked with Alicia briefly about that. This was one of our early days, our collaboration with AAA. We did this pavilion which was one of, one of the first, first it was a really nice exercise to work with students like it is a challenge in, in its own, not that we don't like it, but we have also installed that with students. We have this nice little gaskets on there, which was owed to a German structural engineer. And we really wanted to prove that from a Rhino rendering on the left, that we can go directly onto our water jet, load it in the right sequence and ship it over. So you may think, or you can think already of a 3D printing, but the the workshop is just located somewhere in Europe and you design it over here in London. So I think this, I'm really happy about the 3D printing, but you, I think the, the metaphor can be used also on, and applied on that one as well. So there's a couple of others. This was a, a flying carpet. So geometry control, you know, this was one of the, the first challenges in my endeavor, in my crusade for good architecture. This was a project we never got, but we did lots of work on that one. This was a SAR project. So this was one of the seven generation of mock-ups which we built. So uh, having said this, I mean, this is, uh, there's always many things about uh, mock-ups. I'm a big advocate. First, it is, it's a very good learning exercise for, for both sides. So you really understand then, you know, the challenges on, on each side of the fence. On the other side, you know, you then coming very uh, soon into characteristics of the material. And like you see here, this edge, we call this the edge return because in that case, Saha didn't want to see a thin panel, they wanted to have a thick panel. But uh, thickness means weight, so the whole thing then challenge the envelope. As you can imagine, that the structural engineer is not really happy if we throw instead of 30 kilograms, 120 or 150 kilograms. This changes the whole, not only the structural engineering, but it also drives massively the costs. So in terms of, so all these things are really interrelated and, and, and it also, at the end, as I said, we didn't get the job, but it, it also, one of the critics from the architects, and they were true that this cut it, uh, edge returns didn't match the surface of, of the of the the board, uh, side, so the, which is also obvious. So I draw this line to, to show this is I call it the, the line of my motivation. It's probably a bit politically correct. Usually the the, the motivation after the second one went down to the very bottom. So. You, I couldn't even draw that line anymore, so I kept it above the line. But by doing this on and on, and as I said, I went through seven generation and finally ended up not getting the job, but it really opened up for me a lot of, of, of new things, and I really learned a lot. I mean, first it was good that I could explain it that way to my bankers because I spent the 500,000 bucks on that one, but. Then we ended up to, to, to get that contract, which is also a nightmare within, because we were the, the, the sole 
manufacture for the, for the outer shell. This is also a Saha project in the Middle East, in a really massive one. And, uh, and uh, how should I put it? It is, so there you see our mock-ups. So the, there on the right-hand side, you see we, we further developed the, the, the edge returns. And we could be achieving now not any more. So to cut the long story short, we're now doing on the right-hand side, we're doing a kind of a pouring traditional concrete. And on the left, we go to the thin to another manufacturing. But at the end of the day, for you as an architect, it's, it's you know, it doesn't, it fulfills its destiny. By doing that, we, we came across that technology and we did a nice project like this one where the, the, the product has been used as a sunscreen. All these white panels with the holes are ours and they span floor to floor. And this was really nice. So another, while I'm saying this scarcity, so I said there's really a lack of holistic approach. Holistic, I mean in that way that, that the communication among the, the different trades is very limited. I mean, you have very often this pure European project where, where the main language is English, but nobody understands each other, also that they're all speaking English. And the other thing is that, you know, that, uh, that it's very often design driven, but uh, they usually, you know, in the early days forget to talk to each other and, and come up with a solution. And on that one, I want to specifically focus on, on, on the concept. And there I run into a company called Transolav, Matthias Schuller, which is a good friend of mine. And they, they call themselves the, the climate engineers. And, and the aim there is that despite this very harsh environment of the Middle East with temperatures up to 50 Celsius, they wanted that uh, underneath this umbrella, which is mainly giving shade to the underlying museum, is that they want you that if you wander from one building to another without artificial cooling, which is really a challenge. And, and the way they thought will um, face that problem is by cooling the floor, which while that's why I meant this, this communication issue is so important. While we talked to Matthias and his people, we came up then with a different solution because everybody knows that if you have cold feet and, and a hot head, this is not a nice feeling. So we came up with the, the, the idea to, to, to thermal activate the panels by using the, the thermal mass of the panels by integrating uh, capillary wires or tubes into the, pardon, into the panels. And this radiates then onto you. And, and he was so excited about that idea. And I was so excited about that idea so that I thought we, we're going to do this. So the other thing is the, the lack of, and, and you know, my background is business. I say, I mean, if we carry, or one thing for sure is if we carry on like this, it, it won't work anymore because we'll be soon 3 billion middle-class people, they all consume and, and, and do, and there's especially the building industry, and this was a recent study of, the, of McKinsey's, is so poor on efficiency, you know, that, that they identified 15 drivers of building energy efficiency, and by far, by far, the biggest potential lies into building energy efficiency with some 600 billion dollars. So I think there is a lot of efficiency to be gained. I mean, there is a constraint or a lack of budget out there. I mean, this global crisis and this endless growth model, I think for sure has failed. And, and I especially think that I've chosen this picture to show this is Ulrich Mütter, a German visionary out of the 50s of Eastern Germany, that scarcity of, of certain materials or the lack of certain things is, can be seen not only as a, as, a, as a bad thing, but it can be also a challenge or, or a, an innovator or a driver for, for new things. And he came up with lightweight shells long time before 
uh, you know, anyone or still we are not there, what, what he could do back in the 50s in Eastern Germany and lacking, you know, concrete steel or, or steel reinforcement. So I said, you know, what's really lacking in my opinion, opinion in the building industries is the intelligence. And I always like to reference, you know, to our body. Everybody knows that the skin is, is and I reference my product name to the concrete skin, but the skin is so much more intelligent than, than any building envelope we ever built. So mankind, even in the 21st century, has just achieved that we have, uh, you know, materials on the facade which, you know, that, that you can look through, or we're just starting of, of shading and, and stuff like this. So to me, the, there is little to no intelligence already applied. And so having said this and having the sun out there and, and uh, I went across and everybody knows that the sun on the body also that the air temperature is very low. So we came up with a new product which we're launching and, and, and the, the basic aim is that we integrate small tubes into our thin panels. And uh, you know, being, as I said, like to do a lot of mock-ups. So I was really bullish in, in doing this and we started last summer to, to, to do some demo panels and we really experienced very interesting things. And this I wanted to throw and offload here on uh, at Bartlett that uh, these are things that are really out there. So, I mean, capillary wires or tubes are out there for almost 30 years. So it's an existing technology. I think if you go back in the Roman Empire, they all had floor heating and all kinds of stuff. So it's out there and, and concrete panels have also been out there. So we have come up with, with certain application which we already testing and this is not a good picture, but this is a, a picture I took this morning and this little wall there, which you see up here, this heats that building. And this here, the capillary wire is integrated. And despite that there is, this morning there was zero degree, it goes over a heat exchanger and, and, and the ice storage, but it's really working. Don't ask me about the details, and I think it's, it's not so relevant that we take on this, all these details, but it's a very simple technology. And uh, there's, there's so much things to do about this. And, and if you think about your own skin, I mean, our skin is really by far the best air conditioning system, which we have much more efficient than the existing one, where, you know, every other week you read in the newspaper about the killings of air conditioning. I really don't see, or I really foresee that we in 10 years time, or hopefully even shorter, that we reference that today's uh, air conditioning system, like to the uh, asbestos crisis back in the 60s and 70s, because this is just a bacteria thing. So I'm a bit off topic now, but really what I wanted to say that with these proven technologies, which if you melt it in and, and if you think that through it, it really leads to something new. And we're just at the very tip of the, the, the iceberg, because if you think of buildings who generate their own heat, which is relevant in, in climates like in Austria, but if you think of, of, of bringing down, so we have some serious calculation on the way that we could cut down the air conditioning cost of existing buildings by simply integrating this into this facade materials by 60 to 70 percent. So it's, I mean, by doing this, we first thought we have a source for heating, but the way, the much bigger driver is that, that we have uh, uh, found a way if, if, if you, and, and, and just, uh, uh, think about that, that if you take away the heat from the outside, it doesn't go in. So subsequently, you don't need to cool that building. And this is really something which comes naturally with our facade. So, and it doesn't cost, you know, uh, some more extra bucks. And if I go back to that design and, and say, okay, uh, it is a lead platinum. It's in the middle of the Saudi desert. It is achieved by limiting the, the windows, which to me for a research facility, it's, it's a problem on, on its own. The other thing is that to, to throw on a photovoltaic on, onto the roof, 
it's you know it gives you might gives you some some extra point on, on lead, but it, I think it does not uh, add to the overall uh, well-being within the building versus an approach. And I don't blame Sa for that. Don't get me wrong on that, but uh, it's just you know that what I mean that more intelligence which is already there and we just need to mimic the nature. Uh, yeah. So I think at the end of the day, you know, and this is just a simple rendering from my guys, I mean, this is where I declare we are definitely not good at, so that's why we go to universities and, and listen, because I think that's, in my opinion, so really the imperative that the building industry you know, um, fosters or increases the communication and take this to a next level. And so my imperatives for, for driving my company is that we are really open-minded, so really uh, open to, 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 to collaborate. We have a, a couple of really high-profile research projects going on. We really want to go beyond sustainability. I mean, sustainability, yes, but what we want to sustain, the current system, I don't think that this is a good idea. So we really, that's why I make reference to this scarcity. I mean, we really need to, li to look under these underlying forces. And, and if you look at the current changes ongoing that, you know, that, that uh, we handing over a, a fortune and, and buildings to our kids, the kids that maybe rebuild and, and retrofit buildings, so we don't have answer to that. And there's lots of CO2 coming out of existing buildings. And the other thing is that I'd be glad that this whole 3D printing is for me really a movement that we, we are being able you know, to, to, to use technology and apply it immediately and get an immediate feedback. This is so essential to really bring it to the next step. So that's why we are very into this uh, building mock-up things. So these are a couple of my imperatives, how I will lead my company forward. Another one is really that we have also a cultural mission to make this a, a better planet. And uh, we were participating at the Documenta this year in, in Kassel, which is ours, or Jus Martinez, which is the one of the main curators. She always said this is the Nobel Prize of of, of contemporary art, which is really is on the left hand side, we did together with uh, the Green Building Group uh, donated these pavilions, and it was really good for us because we could really, you know, and this is an Art de Poveri installation of an American group, and it's really, you know, also led me to that uh, thing that only relevance is important because I was recently at the fair, the Bau Fair at, at Munich, which is one of the, the biggest construction fairs in the world. And it's taking place every two years. And I was wandering around and looking at my competitors and, and the whole facade industry. And maybe due to my limitation that I be on a pure manufacturer's point of view, but I saw groundbreaking efforts of my competition, like adding new colors or having a, a sandblasted surface, which I doubt that this is really an innovation or it, or it has some relevance to the problems we are facing at the moment. So coming back to the documenta, the, 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 the main thing I got from that, and that's why it's so important for us also to have this cultural mission to really help to make this a better place is that we really have this input and, and uh, to really, you know, not having all the answers. I'm not saying that I have all the answers, and I do apologize about being cynic in a bit and, and, and try to, or at least try to, to, to challenge also the architects to, to, to look deeper, to ask more questions, to be, you know, um, behind the things, but it's really relevant that we or that we ask the relevant questions, rather than to give answers which are probably not addressing the, the right questions. Okay, so I'd be more or less finished with my lecture, and I'd be glad to take your question if there is any.
you you had a slide um, showing that the um, GFRC panels are the greenest for sound panels. Yeah. Would you mind going back to that slide? No. And what was that based on? It is a, an Austrian research institute, and we did a couple of of parameters which they this one you mean? This one? Yes, and the previous one was saying who did the uh, research? Yeah, it's the IBO Institute in Vienna, so we did it's 2007. And I mean, there's a, this was the, the basis for our lead report, and it was quite good because it, it looked more from a cradle to cradle perspective. Remember when I was talking about the waste and, and I mean, still concrete is not con to be considered as one of the greener materials. And in the case of cement, it's true. I mean, four to five percent of the CO2 emission on this planet is owed to cement or to concrete in a way. But if you compare it in, in this way, and I want to highlight this primary energy requirement of non-renewable resources, saying how much energy you consume in order to, to manufacture one square meter of, of the material. And there was this comparison, us against one millimeter of, of aluminum panel, a fiber cement of 30 millimeter, or HBL, which is a dress bar or a max. <coughs> so those are the market leaders, and they are so-called you know, wood chip, and everybody, including me, would consider this you know, a greener product in terms of the, the energy requirement, but it's definitely not because of the, the thermal process, because of they are well-based with acrylics, and so they're consuming 346% more energy than, than we do in that respect. And this led, you know, and I'm by far not saying that we are on the end, so we just have started. But this has moved first the attention to, 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 to really the aspect. And then we really looked into several issues and we're really working on this. And I think we can do much, much better on, on, than this 205. And has this taken into consideration the uh, expected service life of the, the different materials? No, not this one. Then it would even be better. I assume it, but this is then the cradle to cradle. We are currently doing this as well. And yeah. But I have no results, and this is not my primary expertise. But that's why we hired an external consultant to do that. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Uh, lots of architects, and because you were showing some, yeah. let's say, you were positioned Zavis projects, she in particular uh, looking into this kind of, let's say, parametric design and the uh, idea of differentiated components or differentiation, especially in the facade skins. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit for the benefit of students uh, the process that you maybe did with, uh, I think, with Zaragoza Bridge in terms of. Uh, management of construction site, how one recognizes uh, each panel, because mm -hmm. we have a, a million panels that are different. Mm -hmm. How do you find, uh, and I think that is a big problem in this concept of differentiation, mm -hmm. one of the big problems uh, in terms of, and usually architects don't think about that. Mm -hmm. That's how do you manage, and I know that you did an invention. Mm -hmm. this yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the one thing we learned also the hard way is that if you do a unique design, it means that every, part, every panel is different. And that's why you need to come up with a system to identify where this panel, this specific panel needs to go. And this is from a perspective, if you have a plant somewhere, and if you have a construction site somewhere, in that case, 2,000 kilometers away, and that you have an installer in between, who does who does some assembly, it really increases the logistics on, on the one hand, because at the end of the day, this, these panels all need to form a certain pattern, which is uh, you know, recognized. And also, you can't cheat there. Well, while on an ordinary flat, uniform colored uh, building, you can replace any panel you know, just 
maybe it's sometimes it's too short. That's the only problem. So having said this, on, on that one, and this was back in 2008, we had the idea to, to collect the data because in the architect's design they numbered and they, did, they came up with a nice numbering system. We had on, on this particular bridge, we had about nine different shades of, of gray. So it was even quite hard for my guys in the in the, the factory to differentiate between the grays because if you have laid them out right in front of you, you know, and you have two different grades, you never know which one is which one. So, so this led us to another thing that we came up with a, a measuring system of colors, which is mainly uh, quite ordinary, but we, we measured the, the, the color by LRP values, so we can specifically identify the, the, the color by, by the, the value we get when we measure it. And, and, but first, and I think this was the first to be known in, 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 the, uh, in the concrete industry that we really can guarantee everybody that uh, he gets the color which the architect chosen. And especially with the nature of, an, of, of concrete, this is a challenge within. So we had then to come up with a numbering system. We were working on that bridge with the interface between the Rhino design and, and the numbering system. And our cutting facilities and our logistics where we failed. So this meant a lot of, 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 of Excel sheets and, and manual work, which by 2008 we, we really took three guys almost six months you know, to, to, to figure out because we had to stack it in the right position. So basically we had to, 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 to do the, the assembly and, and the sequence already in our factory. What happened there is also not unique to any construction site. So there is delays, there is uh, things like you know, changes and, 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 and tolerances. And so they, they ended up that the 3D model of the architects from the outer surface didn't match the existing steel frame underneath. So what they had to do then is to adjust the whole thing. So you, you might think that this is, is an easy task, but not when you're having you know, a subframe which is fitting onto it and relying on certain tolerances. And this caused a major delay in that sense. And why I'm saying this is this delay is, is, is quite normal, but what happened afterwards is that we were delivering these panels with our numbering system, which was basically a stick on the back of the panel. And we were delivering this to Saragossa, and it was raining hard, and then there was the sun out, and suddenly did the you couldn't read anymore the stickers. So you, we had them, the panels shipped correctly, we had you know, then placed them correctly, but then there was a logistics and, and again a, a, a bad interface and they stored it somewhere and the guy did then not the, the right sequence, so he stored it the way he thinks was best for him. And so we ended up that two architects had to search then for the right panels and, and just by looking at the panels because the, the stickers was washed away. And this was quite a challenge and, and an unnecessary, unnecessary task, but it's really highlighting if you have a unique design and if every panel is different, it's, it's really about you know logistics and sequence. And uh, having progressed in that sense, like I showed you the, the one in the solid asset, we already integrated. So, well, let's showcase it with that one. So, the, the pavilion, which was about the same time, maybe a bit after the project, uh, we really made possible that we have an interface with Rhino and we can directly transfer the, the, the data onto our machines which was also lots of coding involved because we then had to, to transfer the, the Rhino script into really machine code again. 
So that this what was made possible. So uh, so we've really been able that, for example, if you send us over the Wrangler file, we can really extract and, and cut to size exactly made from your panels. And this one, I mean, compared in size, looks rather small, but this is compared in size to the bridge five to six times, I would say. So, given the lessons learned we had before, so we came up there with already with an RFID chip thingy. It uh, was then cancelled very last minute because RFID chip sounds nice, but uh, there's a problem if you think of ballots and if uh, have a stack of, of different panels, they all say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. So, but if there's 20 of them, so, you, so it's more an issue of identifying it again. So this target system didn't work, that's what I was getting yeah. after this uh, target to chips, yeah. that also didn't work. Yeah. So, no, I, mean, I, I wouldn't say... Up this issue because often architects just kind of model something adventurously yeah. in the computer and they don't talk about all this data kind of leading a system and not even just about geometry, it's just one part of the yeah. story. But for instance, construction site yeah. management and yeah. all these other layers and, and yeah. I think architects are often not yeah. quite aware of these things. Yeah. So, so what is the kind of what is involved in this design ecology yeah. apart from just coming up with a part of geometry? Yeah. Uh, so but I don't blame architect for this because these buildability issues, you know, it, it's just a question, question that you go through that. I mean, I'm more concerned about that, in my opinion, uh, the, 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 the far more interesting question, who is leading that process? And at, at the moment, it's only the business guys, you know? And it's just, they don't want to hear about any quality, whether design quality or product quality, it's only about price. And I would say, you know, at first hand, and given a short time frame, like, as I said, we failed here with RFID, but this is not, that the technology is not ready because we were not ready. You know, the time frame, and then we have to have, at a certain moment, you have to take a decision and say, okay, we go down the, the safe route. So I'll be sure that on our next project, we have this ready and then it will be integrated. But what I rather like to see is that this, this, this collaboration, takes place at the earlier stage, maybe at the design phase, because I think this can save a lot of, of, of money at the end of the day. It might be, you know, not appropriate if you think, you know, this is a kind of, you know, uh, uh, say, friendship before the task, so it's, it's not correct in terms of that you tender out things. It might be true. On the other hand, you know, it, it's by talking to each other straight architects to the manufacturers and maybe having the structural engineer on, on board and at the same time you come up with, with everybody's perspective and, and at the end of the meeting we learn so many times that the, the solutions are so far ahead and so much better which you could never achieve by tendering out to, to several companies and you find one victim who comes in 30% less. And I very often see that the quality of the, the end product is very poor. Yeah, well, in a way, that is also my argument that somehow the constraints of production or constraints of matter are actually positive input for design yeah. rather than an obstacle. Yeah. That's traditionally understood. Yeah. But, anyways, are there more questions? If not, then uh, we'll thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.